All right, we headed out to Duval for all those Jacksonville Jaguars fans out there. It's your boy Justin Henry here on the Justin Henry Show going over all 32 teams fantasy-wise and just talking about the team in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about every single player, so if this is your first time, do not make it the last time. Subscribe to the channel. Drop a like here for me so we can continue to get this fantasy advice all season long. Now, the Jacksonville Jaguars were a team that – was playing really well, and then they fell off as a, as a team towards the second half of the year. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, Trevor Lawrence's injury. We saw the injuries to the receiving core. Uh, this team just kind of fell off. But offensively, um, this is a team that was supposed to have way more punch than it did last year. Trevor Lawrence really didn't take the ascension people thought he would. Calvin Ridley was a big name that was expected to come in and play well. He didn't play as well as everybody had hoped. And, and now this team looks a little bit different than it did last year. So um, there's still much of the same cast, but we're going to have a couple new pieces in here that are going to change from probably the way that things go for the Jacksonville team this season. All right. So let's start with the quarterback position. Trevor Lawrence. Um, I think everybody expected so much more from Trevor Lawrence. He finished QB 13. It was kind of a down year for, for Trevor Lawrence, right? This is a player that we all expected to be, you know, kind of taking the ascension into the top 10 and, and for all intents and purposes, he didn't. So he was QB eight the year before we were drafting him kind of in that same range last year. He threw for 4,016 passing yards had 21 passing touchdowns, uh, 14 interceptions and seven fumbles. So the turnovers kind of, you know, made his value go down a little bit. And I talked about that uh, last season too. the fumbles for whatever reason, Trevor Lawrence does kind of struggle with that. I think this year though, when we look at Calvin Ridley being gone and we kind of look at like what our expectations were of Trevor Lawrence and how he fell short, I think he could be a value in drafts in 2024. So I think last year he was kind of forcing things a little bit, especially when it came to like the Calvin Ridley talk, trying to get him like red zone looks and get him his yardage. He also was dealing with injuries at different points of the season. So if we can get a healthy season out of Trevor Lawrence, if we can get you know, just a little bit more free-flowing offense out of him. He still provides rushing. I like what Trevor Lawrence, his value could be in drafts this year, where right now, you know, you, you probably got guys like Caleb Williams that are going to go over him, Jordan Love, Brock Purdy, Tua tunga A lot of players that he's probably going to be pushed outside the top 12 quarterbacks in fantasy, maybe even a little bit further. So Trevor Lawrence is a name who we all projected to be a generational-type quarterback, a generational prospect. He hasn't lived up to that quite yet, but I do think that there's some room to grow within this offense and for our fantasy teams. Um, his college teammate, Travis Etienne, at running back, played really well last season. He finishes the RB3, got off to a really hot start, had 1,008 yards, 11 touchdowns, also provided 58 catches, 476 yards in the air. So his his the beginning of the season it looked like we were getting uh, an extreme rb1 case and then you know he kind of fell off in the second half slightly efficiency started to go down um and this is one of those players where you were getting him in the third round fourth round last year at drafts now you're gonna have to pay first round price tag maybe second round price tag for travis Etienne. i'm not there I'm not there. And he's probably going to go within the top seven running back. So it probably puts him more in like as a second round pick. I'm not quite there with Travis Etienne. And I think this year we've heard the coaching staff, Doug Peterson mentioned it. It's going to be more of a committee approach. They dropped a tank Bigsby in the third round last year, who I'll talk about here in just a second. Didn't play as well as he had hoped in his rookie year. But I don't think this team, this is the second year in a row now where we've seen Travis Etienne get it, get off to a really nice start. And then kind of start to break down in the second half. So I see this being a long-term thing. They need that running attack there for Jacksonville in order for this offense to hum. Doug Peterson has relied on that consistently uh, in his coaching tenure. We've seen that. And if they can't get Travis Etienne still ripping off chunk plays in the second half of the year, it really stalls out for this off for this uh, this Jags offense as we saw in the second half of last season. So Travis Etienne, I think he's going a little overvalued right now. I'd expect them to rein in his, his touches and kind of spread this thing out a little bit more between their backs. 
Speaking of Tank Bigsby, to me, he looks like the clear number two. Uh, they didn't bring in any new any new running backs this offseason. He did struggle his rookie year, though. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is a pick that I think will be value later on. He's going outside of like the top 60 running backs uh, in ADP right now. Let's see how things sift out over the summer. Um, but I think Tank Bigsby could potentially be a value in your deeper leagues, okay? Uh, especially because I don't really see any competition as his number two. And he's going to get all the opportunity in the world this offseason. Everybody was so excited about him in Dynasty last year uh, and before in redraft. We saw, you know, there was a lot of hype. I think in his second year, there's a little bit less of the hype, a little bit more of the value, which I love. And then when it comes to this receiving core, this receiving core obviously was headlined by the Calvin Ridley edition last year. Uh, he's gone. He's now in Tennessee. So we're looking at, you know, Christian Kirk is the number one receiver for this team, and he was producing like a top – 30 receiver for our fantasy teams last year. And this was before his week 12 injury, um, which saw him out for the rest of the year. So, you know, when you look at Christian Kirk, he kind of reminds me of what like Keenan Allen provides really can sit at a lighter skill, right? He, he, we know what to expect with Christian Kirk and it's not always fancy. It's not always flashy, but he gets the job done. And, this is a player who always seems to slip in drafts because of the name value, because there's always another target hog on the team, right? This is a player who performed 57 catches, 787 yards, three touchdowns uh, in those 11 games. So he was on pace uh, for a really nice year, and he had 1,100 yards the year before that. I don't really see a reason why he would fall off, especially with Ridley heading out the door and the team bringing in uh, a couple new receivers here uh, for this team. So, I think Christian Kirk still assumes the wide receiver one role, and he will be a value in drafts this year as well, especially because we didn't see him finish off the season. Does he offer upside that you want to see? Not on a weekly basis. There's going to be games where he does have, you know, a really nice game, but Christian, Christian Kirk really doesn't have that true ceiling of the, the top 15 receivers that we like. He's just a steady, consistent wide receiver three or four for your teams, especially in PPR leagues. A new addition to the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, Gabe Davis. Probably assumes a lot of the Zay Jones role for this team. Uh, had a decent season in Buffalo. And this is, you know, Gabe Davis, we talked about him over the years. He's ever since that game in Kansas City where he had four touchdowns in the playoffs. It's like we've, a lot of people thought that Gabe Davis was just now going to vault into the elite receivers. And it never panned out in Buffalo. Um, it, his last season, though, for all intents and purposes, he had a decent year, 745 yards, seven touchdowns. It's just very inconsistent with what we get out of Gabe Davis. For fantasy, it sucks because a lot of times it can be one catch for 10 yards or no catches or three catches for 30 yards. And then we got the occasional 120-yard game with two touchdowns. And that's just what you got to expect with Gabe Davis. So I think he's more of a best ball asset than he is a – you know, a fantasy weekly starter that you want to put in your lineups. I let somebody else draft him at this point, but he should provide a nice deep threat option for, for Trevor Lawrence. And I think we get a lot of the same as what he was in Buffalo. I don't think we see too much more of that you got your possession guy uh, in Christian Kirk. You have a little bit more of your electric player, Brian Thomas. So we're going to, I think with Gabe Davis, we know what to expect and he'll have his games. He's going to have his moments just like he did in Buffalo. I just think it's going to be raining a little bit, and I don't trust it fully for fantasy, as I haven't over the last few years, and it's done me well. So Gabe Davis, a good player. He's a good real-life player, but he's just going to be very inconsistent for your fantasy teams. And when you got to draft him and actually start Gabe Davis, that's where it becomes a problem is which week do you start him? And the week you start him is never the right week. The week you bench him, he goes off. I stay away from players. Not all players like that, but Gabe Davis specifically, I stay away from that. All right, and then the last receiver we need to talk about for this team is uh, rookie pick, first-round pick, Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, out of LSU. Expected to come in and play the Calvin Ridley role. Obviously, the team didn't get a chance to re-sign him. They tried and didn't get Calvin Ridley. But in comes Brian Thomas, who has the size you want to see, 4-3-3 speed, uh, first-round pick, like I, I said. So uh, had a really nice season at LSU to finish it out his career. 1,100 yards, 17 touchdowns, and that's one area where I would say Calvin Ridley had a lot of red zone targets and did not capitalize. So 
My only thing is, I think with this team already having some established veteran options in Christian Kirk and Gabe Davis and Evan Ingram, there's not really a need to force Brian Thomas to be the elite guy. I think he'll have some games, but he'll be an inconsistent piece as well, just kind of how Calvin Ridley was. And I don't think they need to force things the same way they were trying to do with Calvin Ridley because he was the name, he was in a contract year, et cetera. They can let Brian Thomas develop. They can let him become the receiver he's supposed to be. And in year one, I know a lot of people are going to be really excited about Brian Thomas. And, you know, he's got wide receiver three capabilities. I think we need to let it ease into the situation because it's not like Trevor Lawrence is throwing for 5K. That's just not who Trevor Lawrence is. Maybe he steps up to 4,500 yards. But Gabe Davis is going to command anywhere from 600 to 900 yards. Christian Kirk's going to be in that 1,000 to 1,200 yard marker. Evan Ingram should be somewhere around the, the 800 to 1,000 yard marker. Travis Etienne will be around 500 yards. Like, it's just there's not a lot of yards left to go for Brian Thomas. So, if he was around the 700 yard and, you know, six touchdown range, I think that's a really solid rookie season, rookie campaign for Brian Thomas. And maybe he did a little bit better than that. It wouldn't surprise me. But to see him be like a thousand yard receiver or, eight to 10 touchdown guys rookie year. I'm not quite sure we're there yet. All right. So just, I know the name's exciting. I know it's a good landing spot. I just think this rookie year, we got to give him time to develop. And then I think we'll see the returns fantasy wise dynasty. I love the pick. Uh, I think it's a great dynasty pick, but for now, for your immediate one to two year type of, of viewpoint, I think we can expect Christian Kirk to still lead this receiving core. And then as far as tight end, and this is definitely part of the receiving core, Evan Ingram finishes the tight end two last year in 2023, man. Had a really strong second half, especially after Christian Kirk's injury. He went crazy. Um, he finished the year with 114 receptions, and PPR leagues was killing. Uh, 963 yards, four touchdowns, and this is his second straight season finishing as a top five tight end. Like we got to give Evan Ingram his props, man. As much as you know, we kind of throw him. He he wasn't reliable for so long when he was with the Giants. Always overdrafted. Now we punish his name enough to where he's become a value in drafts. So I think Evan Ingram, for what it's worth, is still going to be a big cog in this offense. They paid him to be that this off season, and we're going to see strong performances out of Evan Ingram this season. So. It'll be, it looks like this, this PPR type role, this pass catching type role is going to be something that sticks for him. We have to see with him and Christian Kirk on the field, what that translates to, but I still expect Evan Ingram to be part of this passing attack and look more like second half Evan Ingram than he did first half Evan Ingram. That's my gut instinct. So will he be a tight end one candidate potentially, but I think he's just more of a lot to be a top three to five guy that we get just outside that range in drafts. All right. So that does it for Jacksonville. Uh, hopefully you guys got some good info out of that. If there's anybody I did not talk about or any questions you have about players specifically, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next one. Peace.